Welcome to the United Church of Assonet. Today's meditation is, Creator of Light, I praise you for dispelling the darkness of the world, opening my eyes to you and your presence in my life. If you could join me in the call to worship, Psalm 121. A song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? Help comes from the Lord. Made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and, and you're, you're coming, coming in, in from this time on and forevermore. And if you all could rise and sing, Unto the Hills We Lift Our Longing Eyes, found in the New Century, the Black Hymnal, on page 466. Oh, he 
remain standing and um, follow along with the invocation in Lord's Prayer. Righteous One, we are thankful that justice flows from you like a stream. You bid us to come and experience the equity of your love. We rejoice in knowing that justice is an aspect of your love and is without end. Enable us to be steadfast in our hope in you as, as we, we work, work alongside you to ensure those who need justice, justice receive, receive it. it. We pray, we pray as, as Jesus taught us, saying, saying Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead, lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. seated. The announcements can be found on the back of the bulletin. The flowers on the altar are given by Jeff and Cheryl Field in, um, in honor of Cheryl's mother, Leona Wright. And if, if you'd like, you can sign up for um, flowers in the Nothex. I do believe there are some weekends open in November. Please join us after church in Fellowship Hall for coffee hour. Also, if you feel so inclined, please sign up for a coffee hour on the sign-up sheet in Fellowship Hall. It's located just as you're entering the kitchen on the little pin board. The book study will be um, this Tuesday, October 18th at 7. And I believe we are reading chapter 7? 7 and 8 if you can. If not, you can come and enjoy some great fellowship. And the council will be meeting next Sunday at 9 a.m. and we will be having a Blessing of the Beast on Saturday, October 22nd, 2022 at 1 p.m. and uh, Greg will probably fill you in with more about that. 
save the date, the deacons will be having a coffee house with the class action suits from 7 to 9 p.m. on November 5th. I hope all can make it and feel free to invite um, friends or a family. Sunday, November 6th is All Saints Day. So we are looking to um, fill our altar with um, people we have lost so we can have um, memories of people that we've lost on the altar. Reverend Greg's blog is listed here and Reverend Greg can be um, available on Fridays if anyone would like to visit. Please just give him a contact with your request. Contributions of food can be left in the Nathex for the Freetown in Berkeley. And if you have any concerns or suggestions, you can contact the Pastoral Advisory Committee and they are listed on the inside of um, the bulletin. Do we have any other announcements today? How is everybody today? I know that I am excited and ready for a wonderful day. Uh, October is a very busy month for me and my family. That's why we're having the, um, the Bellissing of the Beasts on Saturday um, on the, the 22nd. I was thinking maybe we'll do it on a Sunday after church, but all of my Sundays after church this month are full. And so this was, as, as are my Saturdays, this was the only time I could kind of squeeze it in. But I am very excited um, because I get to hang out with animals, which is awesome. And as I think I mentioned before, I am not particularly squeamish when it comes to animals. So pretty much everything is fair game. And maybe I'll bring my dogs as well if they behave themselves. We'll, we'll have to see about that. Um, also, talking about the fellowship hour, I'm so glad that we're back in the swing of things right now. Um, but I did look at the sign-up sheet. Uh, next week is full, but the rest of the weeks uh, for the year are still open. Uh, I wanted to remind you that uh, that means the next open Sunday would be October 30th. So if you maybe wanted to do something with orange or black or just put out a bowl of candy, <laughs> which is relatively simple to do, um, that's a great opportunity if you wanna, wanna sign up to do that. And I'm sure there's something else that I'll forget and let you know about in the future. But for now, it is the time for our joys and our concerns. We have our continued prayers, which include those for Susan Lemos, for Leon Cudworth Sr., for Tiff Vonica, for Millie Moore. We have our prayers for Mary Nulakala and for Arthur Borges as they recover uh, from their injuries. We have prayers for our friends uh, who have cancer, for Paul Kudo, for uh, Nick Riccardi, and for Paul and Moreno and Walter. We pray for Bobby Files and for Jack. We have prayers for uh, Mary and for Joanne and Jeff and Phil and everybody else in the Miller family that needs, greater Miller family that needs, is still not quite over COVID. And certainly for all other people that have COVID symptoms or other uh, infectious diseases. Uh, we pray for uh, also for Colleen Gleavy, uh, who uh, does have melanoma and uh, has no current treatment plan. Uh, and we do have uh, continued prayers as well for those who are rebuilding their lives uh, after the uh, various hurricanes and other natural disasters. Uh, just because we've moved on to the election in a couple of weeks doesn't mean that people's lives are not affected significantly more by those uh, disasters. Are there any other uh, announcements or prayers this morning? Yes. So we are sufficiently recovered yep. at this point. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, my sister is still recovering from her shoulder surgery without me dealing with COVID much yeah. worse. But um, I think we're, we're open up um, mm -hmm. and uh, all along the way. Awesome. It's good to put it has to slow going. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other prayers? All right. Then let us all pray as one. Our gracious eternal God, 
we bow this day and again ask you to teach us to pray. In such times, we fail to feel your presence. Teach us the discipline of prayer. Rid us of any superficial demand for a feel-good faith so that our prayers might reflect our deep relationship with you. In such times as something in our lives seems hopeless, teach us to pray and not give up. In such times as it seems as if our words go forth but, but lack energy and life, teach us to persist and pray even though we feel little passion. In such times when we despair of ever finding an answer to a vexing problem, teach us to pray and give us courage to continue onward. In such times when we despair of prayer itself and wonder if it does any good, teach us to be persistent as was that widow in Jesus' story long ago. We ask for your gentle care for the least of your children throughout the world, for those who suffer innocently because of cruelty, for people caught in the crossfire of war, for the hungry and the homeless everywhere. Be with them and give them courage in their undeserved crises. Bless our friends and neighbors in their struggles with loss and illness. We pray especially for Susan, Leon, for Tiff, for Millie, for Mary Lou and Arthur, for Nick and Paul, for Moreno and Walter, for Bobby and Jack, for Paul and Mary, for Joanne and Jeff and Phil, for Colleen, and for all those touched by disasters. There are more prayers than we could possibly say, and you know them already. Listen to these silent prayers of our hearts and open our minds that we may have your revelation this morning. O oh God, give us the persistence to knock on your door and to bang at your gates and to not lose heart. Give us the resolve to build a just world. Amen. God's justice is persistent in effecting change and invites us to be generous and tenacious in our giving. Let us bring gifts to further justice and peace wherever they are desired or needed. Let these resources be used to facilitate a just peace for everyone. This morning's offering will now be received.
Steadfast love, one, receive our gifts and the gladness we give them. Thank you that we have an abundance of resources to share so that every need is met. May we always give from wide open hearts, and may what we give be used to bring a balm of justice. Amen. Our hymn of preparation this morning is from the Black New Century Hymnal. It is number 315, O Word of God Incarnate. Let's all sing together.
may be seated. And I'm gonna, I have two more announcements that I forgot during announcements, I'm very sorry about that. But one is um, the, Pilgrim, the Church of the Pilgrimage in Plymouth is celebrating 400 years. And they are having different events on October 29th to the 30th. One is that um, Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer, yep. the General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ, he will be a guest speaker on October 29th through 30th and um, at 10. And then he's doing, there's a bunch of different things they're doing. So it's a, like a long letter. But they have also phoned us because they're very interested in having a um, big turnout. Sounds like it will be a very um, nice event. But I'm gonna leave the letter here so you can look and see if any of the events fit in with your schedules. So I'm gonna leave that in here. And also, we made um, for the blessing of the pets. So if anybody has um, any place that they can hang these, um, that would be very helpful and also for our coffee house which is November 5th so I'm gonna leave the folder here and if you want to take any of these to hang up somewhere or hand out please feel free sorry about that and the scriptures this morning are the epistle lesson is 2 Timothy 3 14 through 4 5 on page 880 in your pew Bibles. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learnt learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will put, not put up with sound doctrine, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to miss. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. And the gospel lesson today is Luke 18, one to eight, and can be found on page 770 in your pew Bible. Then Jesus told them a prayer, always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I will tell you he will quickly grant justice to them and yet when the son of man comes will he find faith on earth good morning again you know it's not every day you celebrate the 400th anniversary of a church so keep that in mind all right so 
have any of you ever seen a sign or maybe it's an image on social media with an inspirational Bible quote like the Lord is my shepherd or be still and know that I am God it's often got sort of that swirly cursive to it anybody seen any of those yeah anybody have any of those in their house okay yep so almost universally uh, these quotes are uplifting and supportive would you agree and rarely do you get some of the other verses you might find in the Bible. Things like, when someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, the thief shall pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. All right? Or one of my personal favorites. When he turned around and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. All right? So you ever heard that one before? It's in 2 Kings. But while these, the verses that we have actually on the posters are supposed to be encouraging, I think some of them may not always be as uniting as they might seem. Like another one that I've seen, for example, uh, comes from the second letter to Timothy, and it was in fact our epistle lesson for today. And it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, this seems innocuous enough, right? But sometimes I've seen this passage used as sort of a marker that some people have a right understanding of the Bible as perfectly inspired by God without any errors, and others who do not feel this way are thus to be condemned, even if they claim to be Christians. And so this, this phrase, this passage, which should be about celebrating the love of God experienced through our scriptures, I see often is used to divide us rather than unite us. And I recall a movie that I showed with my youth group back when uh, I was uh, still in seminary. This was in the mid-2000s and it was called Saved. Anyone ever heard this movie before? All right. So Saved tells the story of a group of uh, kids who attend a evangelical high school in Maryland. And the uh, group in the, in the story is a sort of a, uh, a group of faith within, within this uh, high school of faith, and their solution to any of the many problems that teenagers have is prayer, which is a good thing, but also judgment and rejection, which is a bad thing, I, I hope you realize. So, as you know with these high school stories, there's always a mean girl, and the mean girl in this story is a girl named Hilary Fay who is openly and annoyingly self-righteous, but secretly very cruel, especially to her uh, disabled brother. And the main character in the story is Mary, uh, who is secretly pre pregnant. You can see why her name is Mary in the story. And she realizes, as she's facing with this unexpected pregnancy that, that she, she, she has fallen into, that life is a lot more complicated than she was taught in school. And she begins to look at her friends and see a lot of hypocrisy in what they're saying, especially in Hillary Fay. And when Hillary Fay notices Mary's doubt, she does what any good Christian would do. She tackles Mary and throws her into a van so that she can be exercised or she can have an intervention to, to push the evil spirits out of her. And as you might expect, Mary is angered by her so-called friends calling her a sinner that is backsliding into hell. And as she tries to get away from this situation, Hilary Fay becomes more and more aggressive and finally says, rather insincerely, Jesus loves you. And Mary responds, you don't know the first thing about love. To which Hilary Fay responds by taking her Bible and throwing it at Mary and shouting, I am full of Christ's love. Mary takes the Bible, hands it back to Hilary Fay, and says, This is not a weapon, you idiot. And that scene where the Bible is thrown at somebody, I think, encapsulates so many ways that I feel about how the Bible is used sometimes. Because life is often more complicated than we thought it was back when we were in Sunday school. Looking to the Bible for simple answers to difficult questions can lead us to some comfort, but also to confusion or even condemnation of others. Namely, so using the Bible as a weapon. So when Paul tells Timothy 
in our letter that all scripture is inspired by God, I think that we need to not take this as meaning that scripture is completely perfect, but that it comes from an experience of God which inspired its writers. For example, I don't think that the Bible is correct in commanding us to ask she-bears to come out of the forest to maul uh, several dozen children. The Bible is useful for living a loving and faithful life because its wisdom ultimately does come from God because it points us to form our own relationships with the Lord by feeling the experiences that others had in their faith thousands of years ago. We read the Bible because it is so useful. But how we read the Bible, I think, can impact whether or not we use it as a weapon or as a guide to faith. One of the major battlegrounds over the Bible in history was the development of the historical critical method, also called the higher criticism, which developed in the Enlightenment. Who's heard of this before? Historical critical method, higher criticism, anybody? Cheryl's got her head down, I'm thinking no. <laughs> All right, so scholars looked at the Bible and they began to see it as sort of a, a text like any other text that was open to examination and not just to devotion. And they noticed things. Like if you read the first five books of the Bible, they were probably not written by Moses and in fact showed evidence of, of different textual traditions that developed over hundreds of years, often showing maybe the different biases of the authors. For example, sometimes in Genesis it says they were two of every animal in the ark, and sometimes it says they were five pairs of every animal in the ark. Well, which one is right? Now, then they looked at the development of the New Testament, and they saw that the teachings and words of Jesus maybe came from different oral traditions, and maybe some of them had misquoted Jesus, maybe to promote their own theological agendas. You know, there's a sense that maybe the Bible isn't always as perfect as we want it to be, that it can be seen like any other text. And as this historical critical method gained ground beyond just academic circles, there became a counter movement to it that tried to defend the literal claims of the Bible at all costs. And this was called originally the fundamentalist movement. Who's heard of the fundamentalist movement? Okay, everybody knows that one. All right, it's called the fundamentalist movement because they talked about certain fundamentals of faith that could never be questioned. And among these was the complete inerrancy of the Bible. Now, a softened form of this fundamentalism that doesn't have all the scary aspects of fundamentalism is, fundamentalism is found in the evangelical churches today, uh, to whom the perfect Bible is often a very central tenet. And therefore, at least in the public imagination, you can either read the Bible as a, as a human doctorate which describes Christian mythology, or as the infallible word of God, and there's no middle ground. I think you know how I feel about things that are at extremes, right? I don't like it. So in our book study, we have been reading a book called The Great Spiritual Migration by Brian McLaren, and one of the chapters we just read reiterates some of these interpretations of the Bible that you know, all ministers learn in seminary. Now, according to these issues, we know that many people take the Bible literally, and others argue that the Bible cannot really be taken literally, it should instead be understood metaphorically. And so, to these people, we think metaphorically, it doesn't matter whether various events actually took place or not, but rather it's what they mean to the person who reads them and how they shape their lives. I'll give you an example. I think that many people who are faithful and loving read the Bible and see the story of Adam and Eve and may not believe that they were the first human beings that lived 4,000 years ago, that maybe there was a development of humanity over hundreds of thousands of years. But that doesn't mean that the story of Adam and Eve is worthless or wrong. It points to truths, truths in that story about how we're all equal because we reflect the image of God and the truth that we all make mistakes that separate us from God. These are critical to our understanding of what it means to be human in the world. 
And so we've got this literal side and this metaphorical side. But McLaren also talks about another axis, which relates innocent versus critical thinking. And he adopts this from the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. And so we start off with this innocent level, which again tends to take things uh, relatively literally and takes things at face value. So the Bible means literally what it means, or the Bible is, is metaphorical, it means what you want it to mean. Very simple, very standard. But this innocence is very important because it is the beginning of our wisdom. And in fact, we, if we cannot claim this, this innocence, it's going to be very difficult to love God or to strive for God's kingdom, for as Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom, like a little child, will never enter it. But as the story of Adam and Eve teaches us, we do not stay in a state of innocence. As we get older, we begin to question things, and we notice some of the inconsistencies in the things that we're told. You know, we get to the point where our parents tell us, do it because I said so. And we say, I'm not sure that's a good enough reason. Maybe I have to think about it. And so this idea of asking critical questions is extremely important to the psychological development that we all go through. Because it allows us to face the twists and turns and unexpected things that happen when you become an adult. And so, in schools, this critical thinking is often encouraged. But what is really good for when you take English or science classes maybe can be problematic if you're a person of faith. Because you begin to doubt everything that the Bible tells you. And so when you look at this Bible and you've come from a non-critical state and believe that it's completely literal, and you get these critical ideas, you begin to look at the Bible and say, that's wrong. And they can just reject it entirely. It's why we so often find people so zealously defending the Bible and other people looking at it as just this crazy document that's, that's full of superstition or mythology at best and is a source of hate and judgment, a weapon at worst. But it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this war between the Bible is fake and the Bible is, is true. There's, there's a greater truth here. Because Ricoeur doesn't just talk about this level of innocence or this level of critical thinking. He has another level on top of that. He calls it a post-critical phase or a second naivete or a second innocence. And this develops when we work through our critical phase to find some integration on the other side. We don't stop at innocence. We don't stop at critical thinking. We move to something more. And we recognize that maybe the Bible may not be literal about everything, and it may have imperfect human understandings and biases. You know, like it's supporting of slavery, for example. But the story does not and there. Having understood things critically, we can then appreciate them with new eyes. We can return back to that joy and that meaning we found in our first innocent readings. You know, the way I think of it, it's kind of like looking at a painting or a movie, for example. When you're an innocent observer, you look at the painting and you say, that is a pretty painting. Or you look at a movie, it's like, that's a great movie. But then if you're a critical student, you begin to examine like maybe how the brush strokes work or maybe how the edits are done or the lighting is, is done. And you think about the historical context of it being in the Renaissance or it being in the New Wave era. And so you begin to know all these things about how everything works. And so when you watch the movie or look at the, the, the painting, you see all those little ideas. It's all sort of broken up into fragments. And all you can see is how the fragments are there but you no longer appreciate it as just being a beautiful picture or a good movie. But the true connoisseur, the true person who really appreciates these things, knows that technique, knows that history, but then finds that the painting or the movie is more beautiful than it ever was before because they can see how it works together and it gives them that greater appreciation 
so that it's, they can love it just like they used to love it. And I think we can see this, this in the spiritual journey of our friend Mary back from the movie Saved. At the beginning of the movie, Mary is completely devoted to that simple, innocent faith in God and all of her prayer life within her school. Again, she's a teenager. She's supposed to be innocent. But then as things get complicated, she begins to question things, and she rejects the phony spirituality of Hilary Fay, and she finds wisdom in the hard questions that some of her friends ask, like the troublesome Jewish girl or her gay friend who is then sent away for conversion therapy. These are people she loves very much, and yet they challenge this worldview that she's always had. And so as the soon-to-be teenage mother, she is then, then rejected by most of all she's been known by her friends, by the principal, even her mother's a little iffy about the whole situation. And so it would be natural for her going through those situations, not just as a critical eye, but as someone who's being actively rejected, to just say, oh, look, Christianity is fake. It's a fraudulent waste of time. But that's not what Mary does in the movie. Because she, no lo she may no longer believe that everything that she was taught may be correct, but she keeps that greater message, that innocent core that she had as a young person, the message of God's love and God's forgiveness that she uses to guide her faith and be a better person moving forward. So how does this idea of this innocent, critical, second innocent lens apply to, say, one of the stories we heard in our Bible today from the Gospel according to Luke. This is a parable that's told about an unjust judge who doesn't respect anybody, but there's a widow who wants justice done because somebody is going against her, and she goes to the judge and he says, leave me alone, and she goes to the judge and she goes to the judge and finally just says, shut up, I'll do whatever you want, because he's tired of being bothered. And Jesus concludes... And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So if we had an innocent reading of this story, we might say that God always brings justice to those who cry out, who demonstrate their faith by praying and praying. But experience teaches us that this may not always be the way. That a lot of times you pray and there are injustices that persist. They persist for you day after day and maybe even over generations. No matter how much people pray. And if you have that critical mind, you might see this story as an example of how the Bible may not be true, or how it might use this expectation of justice through prayer as a substitute for fighting for injustice in the world, something which could therefore challenge the unjust and powerful who want to keep the masses placated with the opioid of religion. You've heard that theory before, right? But the one who has arrived at this second innocence knows that while justice does not always come when we want it to come, Jesus' true message here is about faith. The faith that we all need to keep persisting in the face of failure just like that widow did. Because we may have to pray 10 or 100 or a million times before we see justice done. But our faith gives us the hope that God's love will be proven around us one day, and that allows us to see the world with hope and with appreciation. The second letter to Timothy has more to say about Scripture than just the fact that it is inspired. Paul paints a picture of a world filled with scoffers and sinners. People like to cherry-pick the parts of religion that they like or just ignore it altogether, who pursue their own pleasures. I'm so glad that, that things in the 21st century are very different than they were in Paul's age. And Paul tells Timothy that preaching the good news to an indifferent world can feel as, as pointless as just praying and praying, praying for justice. But as we know, Scripture does not need to be perfect to be inspired by God or useful for forming a relationship with God. But Paul says before we can reach this mature faith, we need to start with 
that innocence. Paul writes, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So the lessons that we learn in childhood, even if they become challenged or even forgotten in adulthood, often find their way back to us when we need them the most, when we work through those problems and find our faith on the other side. But I have one more question for you. What if you did not learn the scriptures as a child? What if you grew up in an unchurched household or were taught that the Bible was something that weirdos used, sometimes as a weapon, something in fact so dangerous that it was forbidden to be spoken about in the classroom? How could you then have that innocent faith and belief in the kingdom of God? I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we have to our faith. And so it is up to us to read our Bibles. And not just for ourselves, but for others. We must read our Bibles with sophistication to look through all the cynicism of our age, but also with an infectious passion so that others cannot help but be moved by how we behave and how we believe. Because despite its imperfections, despite its bizarre and frightening passages and its occasional calls to violence, both from humans and from she-bears, the Bible is inspired by God. It is useful for teaching and correction, and it does equip us for every good work that God calls us to do and which God then invites us to share with the world. Let us pray. God, you know through your revelation in the person of Jesus Christ and the records of our ancestors' experience of you. Help us to pray as they did, to wisdom and to have courage all their days. Amen. Jesus tells us to keep praying and keep praying. So we know what a friend we have in Jesus, which is in fact our closing hymn. It is from the Red Pilgrim Hymnal number 335. So let's all stand up and let's all sing together.
as you depart this space, may you be committed in persisting in prayer. May you add your voice with those who cry for justice and who take actions to ensure that justice prevails. Go forth knowing that you are heard and that you can hear. God is with you now. Now go with God. Amen. Let us turn to each other and sing, Blessed be the tie that binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that.